mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. From an outsider's view, Advent has to be one of the strangest seasons of the church year. So while the calendar of the world dictates that our Christmas celebrations are to begin the day after Thanksgiving, or even before that these days, Father Michael recently said that Costco had Christmas trees in August, which I don't doubt, the church calendar does something a little bit different. It actually invites us to use these same weeks leading up to Christmas as a time of preparation. So while TV is full of Christmas specials and holiday ads and endless replays of both Home Alone 1 and Home Alone 2, which I think we can all agree is an unqualified good, here in church, the themes of our readings and prayers and music that we find on these Sundays of Advent are those of human sin, of our need for repentance, of Christ's second coming, to rule all things and to judge both the living and the dead, and a focus on the darkness that sin casts over the entirety of this world and our longing and yearning to be delivered from it. So just listen to some of the verses from the hymns that we sing during this season and hear how different they sound when you compare them to the Christmas songs and songs about Santa that we've been hearing on every radio station and in every store ad nauseum for weeks now. Here's one we sing on the first Sunday of Advent. Lo, he comes with clouds descending, once for favored sinners slain. Thousand, thousand saints attending swell the triumph of his train. Alleluia, Christ returns to reign. Every eye shall now behold him, robed in dreadful majesty. Those who said it not and scorned him, pierced and nailed him to the tree, deeply wailing, shall the true Messiah see. That's not making it on the radio. How about this one we sung a few moments ago? Hark the voice of one that crieth in the desert far and near, calling us to new repentance since the kingdom now is here. Oh, that warning cry, obey. Now prepare for God away. That's not making it on the radio either. And then maybe the most famous song of this season of Advent we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, who mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. So at this time of year, when the pace of the world around us seems to keep ramping up, these themes of Advent actually get us ready for Christmas by almost forcing us to slow down and to confront and to consider the sin and brokenness that Jesus saves us from, both by his first advent and by his second advent, when he will return to put away sin and death forever. And this means that advent really is a time of preparing the way for Jesus, not just in the life of the church or in the church year, but also within ourselves, within our hearts. And this idea of preparing the way of the Lord is what this third Sunday of Advent is all about. So we see it in the figure who is the main focus of this Sunday, the one who graces the cover of our bulletin this morning, John the Baptist, this one who comes and appears in the wilderness and prepares the way for Jesus by telling people to repent of their sins, then baptizing them for the forgiveness of those sins. We also see this theme in our collect for today where we asked God to make his way ready within us by taking our hearts and turning them from disobedience and towards his wisdom. And while the theme is in all of our readings, it's there in abundance in our Old Testament reading this morning from Isaiah chapter 35. So in Advent, Isaiah is kind of like an old friend. We hear Isaiah all the time during this season of the church year. And that's because what Isaiah's doing in his book is he's not only delivering this prophetic word of warning to Israel in his day, telling them to repent and return to the Lord. But he's also talking at the same time about God's future plan of redemption and deliverance through a coming king in the line of David. This king who will rule all the nations of the world and establish God's justice 
here on earth. And that king, of course, is Jesus himself. So here in chapter 35, we find Isaiah delivering a word about God's coming salvation. And in one sense, this salvation of which Isaiah speaks is all about what's happening in his day, which was that Israel, yet again, was in open rebellion against God. Israel had turned away from God and were seeking their own way of living and being in the world. And in the book's first chapter, we find God lamenting over Israel and saying that Israel, these children whom he had reared and brought up, have now rebelled and turned against him. So God calls Isaiah and gives him a job to go and speak a message to his people about the consequences of their rebellion if they continue in their ways. The consequences are that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed and that they will be taken out of the promised land and carried off into exile. So many of the chapters of Isaiah that you find before today's reading are either pronouncements of God's judgment against Israel or they're warnings of the awful consequences that are going to result from their rebellion. But at the same time, if you read through those chapters, you'll see that woven through all of these judgments and warnings is also a constant theme of hope. So Isaiah keeps hinting at and telling of this salvation that God is still going to bring about in spite of all the awful things that Israel is going to end up having to face. And here in chapter 35, Isaiah really paints a picture of that coming salvation. And it's a beautiful picture. He says that when God comes to bring salvation, that the wilderness and the dry land will be glad and that the desert will blossom like a flower and rejoice with singing. And that God will make the barren wilderness to have the glory of verdant and beautiful places like Lebanon and Carmel. And he says that God will come with justice and vengeance to save his people from the calamity that they brought upon themselves. And that when God does come to do this saving work, that the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, that the lame person will leap like the deer and that the tongue of the mute will now sing for joy. He says that God will make streams of water in the desert, and that the hot burning sand will be turned into pools of water, and that God then will make a highway in that place that's called the way of holiness. And Isaiah describes it as a safe path for his people where there are no lions or ravenous beasts seeking to harm them. And this path is so safe, in fact, and sure that even the foolish people who are on this path won't be able to wander off of it. And this highway that God makes, God will personally lead those whom he's ransomed from captivity back home to Zion, where they will have everlasting joy upon their heads. So like so much of what Isaiah is foretelling, this vision of salvation points well beyond his own day toward God's ultimate plan for the redemption of the world in Jesus. And there's probably no better evidence for this than in our gospel reading this morning, which we heard a few moments ago, where we see John the Baptist, who at this point is in prison, sending his disciples to Jesus in order to ask him if he really is who he says he is, the Messiah of Israel, or if they need to wait for someone else who's coming later. And Jesus responds to John's disciples by paraphrasing this exact passage from Isaiah. He says, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus is saying that he is the fulfillment of what Isaiah foretold and that his arrival means that God's salvation is now here in the midst of the earth. And so with all this talk about preparing the way of the Lord and this way of holiness that Isaiah says God will make for his people. It's also no accident that Jesus eventually will refer to himself as being the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus tells us that he himself is the way to salvation, the way that leads us home to God. Isaiah's prophecy shows the staggering beauty of this salvation that we're preparing to welcome into the world in this season of Advent. 
that Jesus is the one who comes to us to bring God's justice, to make right what is wrong, to bring healing and new life, not just for God's people, but for all of creation. That Jesus comes to guarantee that God is faithful to us and that he will safely deliver us home to the new Jerusalem where there will be gladness and joy and where sorrow and sighing will flee away. But also notice where this salvation is taking place. Isaiah tells us that all this is happening in the wilderness, in the desert, in a place that's innately hostile to human life. And the desert's a place over and over again the biblical authors associate with danger and with scarcity and with desolation. It's not a place that you want to be. But the truth is that under the power of sin, the world that we live in is itself a sort of desert. It's a place where the conditions are hostile towards the good and the true and the beautiful taking root and flourishing. It's a place where the ground is parched and where living water often feels really impossible to come by. It's a place where we daily face the tragic effects of sin in the wider world, in our own lives, and even within ourselves. And in some ways, this holiday season, this time of the year, can seem even more desolate than other times of the year. Because these holidays have a way of bringing into focus the brokenness of the world. For many, the holidays bring to the surface the painful losses of loved ones that we've endured over the past years. For others, the family gatherings that often happen surrounding Christmas aren't occasions of fun and joy. They're not the things of an ad you'll see on TV, but instead they're awful reminders of the hurt and brokenness and division that exists within our own families. And yet, even as we do find ourselves in this wilderness, this desert, Isaiah is pointing us towards our great hope, which is that it's precisely in the midst of the desolation of life that God's salvation springs up. Our hope is that God makes his way actually right in the middle of the mess of life. You see, the world around us at this time of year wants us to simply drown out the difficulties of life with festive cheer and constant celebration. But in the end, that offers us no real relief from the pain we face and no real fulfillment of our deep desire and longing to be redeemed. But because we have seen the beauty of God's salvation, and we know that that salvation can come and does in the midst of the desert of life, in this season of Advent, we can actually face into our own brokenness and the brokenness of the world around us and not be completely destroyed by it. We can take an honest look at the world as we see it now, a world that's dark, confused, and wearied by the tragic effects of sin and the power that sin wields over it. And we too can look within ourselves at the way that this power of sin has been at work in our own lives, how we find ourselves just like ancient Israel in our own sort of captivity and exile as we wait for Jesus to come and set us free and to open for us the way that leads to redemption. The real gift that this season of Advent gives us is that in confronting the brokenness of the world, we find ourselves at the same time really being pushed to look for the one who first came and who is coming again to redeem all things. That as we take these few weeks to stop and to slow down and to enter into the darkness of this world, we're actually preparing the way of the Lord by setting the stage that we can truly see Jesus, the light who has come into the darkness of this world, a light that is so bright that the darkness of this world will never be able to overcome it. And the brightness of Jesus and his light means that even in the darkness, even in the desert, even in the midst of desolation, that we can still find strength and peace and that ultimately we have no reason to be afraid because we know that God has come and we know that God will come again. 
to save us and deliver us. Amen.